imagine in worship with us tonight. Uh, ju just a couple quick announcements that coming up I want you to be mindful of. Um, on the third Sunday, we are having Purple Sunday. Uh, it, it's the first Sunday of Lent, and we sort of do Purple Sunday here. So if you have something purple, wear purple. Become part of the Sea of Purple. It also happens to be our anniversary Sunday. And so uh, find someone, find a friend, and bring them with you on our anniversary Sunday. Uh, Reverend uh, uh, Cindy Andrew Luper, who is the senior pastor at Holy Trinity United Church of Christ in, in uh and Nashville will be our speaker that evening. So please come and be a part of it. Next Wednesday night, next Wednesday night, instead of the Wednesday night praise and worship, we will be having our Ash Wednesday service. And so uh, with the imposition of ashes and so forth, so please come. And you're invited to begin that. Go out and get your party out of your, your Mardi Gras party out of your system this weekend and come in and get those ashes because uh, uh, and some of you come in and get saved next I'm just, I guess I should say, some of y'all go sow you, sow you wild oats and then come in and pray for crop failure next week. <laughs> anyway, anyway uh, also coming this Sunday, All Together Ministry is going to be meeting afterwards. Uh, don't forget that the Youth Discipleship Now weekend is coming up. You'll be hearing more about that in, in the coming days. Uh, also, this coming Sunday, I want to remind you that the uh, Youth Cookie Bake Sale uh, is sort of in support of the discipleship. Uh, we can so do some scholarships and uh, tickets to the concert and stuff they go to. I want to remind you of that that's going on. Also, the Wooden Roses uh, uh, bow um, to support the uh, scholarships to Excel Weekend is going on. So a lot of things are going on, so be mindful of them. Keep those things in mind as we go through the week, and, uh, and we know that God will bless you. If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. If you love the Lord, say amen. amen. If you really love the Lord, let's stand on our feet and begin to worship. One of my favorite songs, I'm Afraid of God. Such a powerful, powerful meaning. Think about these words tonight as we sing them. What it really means to you. Because that's the message I want to carry out.
if you love the Lord tonight. <laughs> Friends, if that doesn't get you excited, you know, I, I, last Wednesday night, a couple Wednesday nights ago, we were talking about our different paths that we took getting here. You know, I've been here coming in about six years. I think, yeah, it's almost said. The good thing that I remember the most is when you walk through those doors the excitement and the love that you feel, it doesn't matter because that's what covenant stands for. We are all united together in our love for Christ. That's what Christianity is about. That's what this church stands for. Like I said Sunday at the offering, friends, I'm here to tell you that covenant is alive and well and it is growing and it is on its way up. That's something to get excited about to go out and tell your friends because we are still here. We may have walked through some valleys, but praise God we're climbing back up that mountain. We are sitting back up on the top again and we are here to tell everyone that Jesus is alive. We are coming upon Easter. Jesus is alive and he is still here and alive and well at Covenant. Give God some praise. What are we singing next? I don't even know. Another one of my favorite courses. I love you, Lord. This is, this is just a time for you to go one-on-one -on -one and worship the Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. That's what we're here tonight to do, to worship him and lift his name on high. Yes, we 
you here for. This is for you, Lord. A sweet, sweet sound. just to tell everybody that Jesus Christ is still the King of Kings. And we exalt you because we love you. So we gather tonight, Lord, and we welcome you into this place. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Would you turn to those about you and welcome them? I exalt thee.
as you can tell, I'm not Bobby Kazi, as the little program says. You all have heard several times and you've heard Pastor talk about how this is a growing service. And I am very thankful and proud to say that yes, this is a growing service. While some weeks we may be down in numbers, sometimes the growth is in spiritual growth. That's the most important growth that we could ever experience as Christians. That's the word that we need to share as Christians and that unconditional love and loving the way that Jesus wants us to be. We can do that by your tithes and your offerings so that we can share God's unconditional love. Would you please come forward for the tithes and offerings?
Heavenly Father, yes, we do thank you tonight. We thank you for all of your grace and all of your mercy. We thank you for these tithes and offerings and these generous people here tonight. We ask that you bless each gift and each giver for the furtherment of this church and our ministries. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Give them all to Jesus, and he will turn your sorrow into joy. Thank you, Lawana. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, all of you, for your wonderful gift and music tonight. Amen. We're in our series on the Beatitudes, those eight statements of Jesus at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know if you've ever noticed them closely or not, uh, but the four of them deal with our relationship with God, and then four deal with our relationships with each other. And the one tonight that we're going to be looking at, mercy, has to do with our relationships with each other. It's based on that one from Matthew 5, Verse 7, reading it from the J.B. Phillips translation. Happy are the merciful, for they will have mercy shown to them. And what Jesus is really saying right there in the Sermon on the Mount, that great sermon is, you get what you give. It's the law of direct return. You, you, know, you know what a law is, don't you? A law for God is not something you beat up somebody with. That's what people have done with the law. But a law of God is one that is an established principle. It works the same every time. It doesn't deviate. And so this is the law of direct return, this merciful law. What you give is what you get. And we need to remember that. You see, if you criticize other people, you're going to get criticized. If you are friendly to other people, they'll be, people are going to be friendly to you. And if you're merciful to other people, people are going to be merciful to you. It's the law of direct return. It's an established principle. That's why you ought to be careful with that mouth of yours. Bobby. <laughs> That's why you ought to be careful in how you hurl accusations and criticism. If you want to be happy, treat people right. Be merciful. And so tonight, let's talk about mercifulness. As we consider, you get what you give. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you that we can give it all to you. And you'll turn our shattered dreams, our broken toys, all of it into joys because it's really about the law of direct return, Lord. Help us to understand that and how we conduct ourselves and how we treat others. For we will pray that you will teach us the benefits side of you get what you give. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. What is mercy? Mercy, as I said right there in uh, your notes, is what? Uh, some of you can't read, I see. Mercy is what? Love it's love in action. What I mean by that is that it's more than this attitude or just feeling sorry for people. That's not what mercy is. Mercy is actually doing something. God is a merciful God. Uh, notice Psalms 145 and verse 8. God is kind and what? Slow to get and full of? You see, if you want to be like God, you got to learn to be merciful. Now, how do I know 
when I'm showing mercy. There are four marks of mercy, four very distinguishing marks of mercy. And as we go through these, I want you to evaluate yourself as to how you're doing with this. Uh, I want you to examine yourself and just see how merciful you are, okay? Don't think about that person sitting beside you. Alicia, don't think about Amanda. You think about you. <laughs> no, no, you can think about Bobby because it's probably aimed at her. But that's a different story. But that wasn't merciful, was it? But mercy ain't what you say, it's what you do. Okay? So if you give it, you get it. If you don't give it, you don't get it. It's just that simple. It's the law of direct return. If you don't give mercy to other people, you ain't going to get it back to yourself. And so the first thing is, if I am merciful, I'll do what? I'll be patient with those who are peculiar. I don't know about you, but I absolutely believe one of those laws of the universe is that in every life, some weirdos must fall. <laughs> Has that happened in your life? I mean, come on. Maybe their elevator just don't go to the top, or maybe they're good eggs and just a little crack, but something's wrong out there. Okay? And so how do you deal with those obnoxious people? What does the Bible say about how you deal with that kind of person? Well, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 14 tells you, encourage the timid, help the weak, and be patient with everyone. Are you patient with everyone? Now, some people will try to use that against you. Okay? If you are a leader, there are times you have to deal with people's bad behavior. That don't mean you ain't being patient with them. Okay? The board directors over the years here have, t uh, have been angry at me because I've been overly patient with people. I take too long to... They think they are wrong. Okay? But they think... I, I, I give people too much leeway. Amen? And staff people too. Okay? Because I'm actually not patient with everyone. I really am not. I mean, the Bible says if I'm going to be merciful, though, I've got to be patient with those people who are peculiar. How can you be patient with people who are peculiar? The, the way you're patient with them is that you learn, you need to take the time to learn something about their background. Because if when you understand where a person come from, you stop thinking about, look how far they got to go, and you start looking at how far they've come. True story. There is a person in this church who used to do stuff, and sometimes still do, stuff that just bugs the daylights out of me. Drives me up a wall. And one day I took that person to lunch and I asked, why do you do those things to annoy me? And he shared his story with me. And it changed everything for me. I no longer think of the things that he does. They don't irritate me anymore. Because I look at how far he's come, not how far he has to go. You see, when you learn someone's background, that can make you a little bit more patient. I mean, you look beneath that external behavior, the, uh, that goofiness, that uh, whatever it is, and you look at what that person has been through. Sometimes it's been pain. And behind every peculiar behavior, you will find either a loneliness, a hurt, a depression, a, a kind of anxiety, or something that God says we need to look at and understand that person. Absolutely, baby. <laughs> and the Bible says it this way, accept each other in the Lord, even as Christ has accepted you. Ooh, how well are you at doing that? Think about that the next time you think that person is goofy. Or they think that person, something's wrong with them. Ask yourself, do I know what their life is? Do I know what has driven them? 
what made them like they are. You see, merciful people are accepting people. They're not quick to criticize and to judge, and they realize that hurtful people are hurting people. Amen? So if I'm merciful, I'll be patient with those who are peculiar. The second thing is this. If I'm a merciful person, I'll what? I'll forgive those who have fallen. You know, my mama said one time, I remember, you, any of you remember when Jim Baker and Tammy Faye had their fall from grace and everybody was jumping on the bandwagon, beating them up, and, 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 and I remember that uh, I was home when this happened, and mama, and this is late in mama's life, and, and we're sitting there, and, and we're just watching TV, and, 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 and uh, Jimmy Swaggart came up. And he was on the news talking about Jim and Tammy Faye. Little did we know what was coming up for him, huh? But, uh, but, but we just stand, I remember sitting there with Mama, and we're watching it, and, 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 um, and he was talking about how they were a cancer on the body of Christ that needed to be exercised and cut off. And I turned to Mama, I said, what do you think about that? And she said, oh, he belongs to the First Stone Society. I said, what? She said, oh, he belongs to the First Stone Society. And I still didn't get it. She said, you know, you who without sin cast the first stone. She said, it's, you know, the, you need to understand the Christian army is the only one that kills its wounded. Interesting thought, huh? And I looked at her and I said, that was deep, honey. <laughs> The Christian army is the only arm in the world that kills his wounded. Let me ask you something. When pe people make mistakes, do you rub it in or do you rub it out? When people let you down, do you hold it over their head the rest of their life? Never let them off the hook? That's not mercy. Once again, I ain't ever telling you to let, be, let somebody be your, make you into a doormat. You need to address issues. Amen? And, and if they throw this at you, say, no, my baby, baby, being merciful is not letting you get away with this. Amen? But I know someone, they're not part of this church, thank God, but, but who for someone whose partner many years ago did some, a very foolish thing very early on in their relationship. It was a dumb decision that he made it. But the person who... The, the, spouse, the spouse who did it asked the other spouse for forgiveness. And they said they forgave him, but I'll never forget it. And so they, in reality, they never forgave, okay? And he held it over the, his partner's head like it was a, a, a battering ram, kept reminding him of it. He'd even use it to justify his own bad behavior because that's how people operate in you know, that passive-aggressive thing, you know. Uh, the reason I'm so bad is because you did this to me. Anybody, anybody ever been, uh, known that type of situation? And, 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 one, and one, after about seven years, the pa one day, that partner just walked out and said, forget this. And he was devastated. My God, why did he do this? And I looked at him and told him, I'd have left a long time ago if I was in. I didn't feel sorry for him one bit. You've done this. You've been running them off for seven years. I'm just surprised it took him this long to leave. Amen? Colossians 3 and 13. Be gentle and ready to forgive. Never hold grudges. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Forgiveness is, a, have you ever noticed that forgiveness is an interesting thing? When we need to receive forgiveness, it just feels so right when we get it, doesn't it? But when we are called upon to give it to somebody else, it just feels so wrong. Has anybody ever experienced that? Because at that point, we don't want to forgive. We want justice, Right? You know, sort of like the queen who went to have her picture, got made up in dragon, went and had her picture done by a photographer, and she got the pictures in the mail, and she took them back to the photographer and said, this picture does not do me justice. And the photographer looked at her and said, honey, 
you don't need justice, you need mercy. <laughs> it's a lot easier to criticize than it is to sympathize. It's a lot easier to point the finger than to lend a helping hand. But if I'm patient, I'll be forgiven to those who have fallen. Number three, if I'm merciful, say it again. No, when you're down, I'll step on you. No, when you got him down, kick him. No. That seems to, going back to what Mama said, the Christian army seems to be the only arm in the world that kills its wounded. Somebody is hurting. Do we help them? No, we make it worse. We add our mouth to it. Woo. He didn't go there, did he? Yes, he did. Look at Proverbs 3 and 27. Whenever you possibly can, do good to those who need it. Mercy is a practical assistance. There are people all around you who are hurting. And at, at your work, in your circle of friends, here at, certainly here at church, there are people who are hurting. And honey, feeling sorry for them is not being like Christ. Doing something about it is being like Christ. Maybe they just need to know you care. Because remember, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So being merciful is when you take action and when you do something about it. 1 John 3, 17 18 says, If someone who is supposed to be a Christian has enough money to live on and sees another one in need it but won't help, how can God's love be in that person? Let's, just, let's stop just saying we love people. Let's show it by our actions. I have to tell you, that verse stabs me like a dagger. Don't just say we love people. Show it. Really help people. John Wesley's great motto, you know who John Wesley is? John Wesley's great motto was do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. That's a great motto, isn't it? In other words, help those who were hurting. He's probably one of, the, one of the men who made one of the most greatest impacts on the world. He's the founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley. And he was not a Methodist, okay? He founded the, Western Church, the Methodist Church. Uh, he actually was an Anglican priest, and he never left the Anglican Church. But his teaching started the Methodist Church. And he says when you see someone hurting, a merciful person does something about it. It is said that John Wesley made millions in his lifetime off of the books he wrote and died almost penniless. Not hurt. I mean, he, he, he didn't die a, a disadvantaged life. It's just that he gave it away. When he saw someone in need, he did something about it. Amen? You remember the story of the Good Samaritan? A man was mugged in a bad section of town. Where is Carrie? He needs to hear I'm just saying. <laughs> was mugged in a bad section of town. I shouldn't say that, should I, sister? She takes offense to that. And he was thrown over to the side of the road. And two church folk walked by. I'm sorry that happened to you, but uh, I can't get involved. I'm late for a meeting at the church. <laughs> but the third man came along and took action, took him to the Holiday Inn, left his American Express gold card to take care of him and said, I'll pay for it all. And Jesus said, that's mercy. Jesus said, happy are those who care enough to get involved. Jude 1 and 22 says, be merciful to those who doubt. Let me tell you why that verse is there. Did you hear that? Be merciful to those who doubt. Have you ever doubted? Let me, let me let you in on a little secret. When you're hurting, 
that's the most likely time that you're going to doubt. You're going to say things like, where's God in this? You're going to say things like, God's not hearing my prayers. Maybe God, maybe God just don't care. Maybe God doesn't even exist. That happens when you hurt it. It's called a season of doubt. And if you're in pain, you know exactly what, if you've ever been in pain, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's the time that doubt rolls in. That's the time no evil. Like if you're sick. Like when I was in the hospital a couple of years ago, and, 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 uh, and when I got out, it took me, y'all know, it took me forever to get my energy back. And the doctor, and I'm thinking something's wrong. I began to doubt my health. Pam was telling me, no, you're fine. Dr. Spiegel was telling me, no, you're fine. I went back to Dr. Blaylock, my surgeon, uh, because people were telling me when they had this surgery, they just bounced right back. And Dr. Blaylock had to tell me, uh, they've seen one surgery, I've seen 2,000. You're well ahead of the game. But when you're in pain or when you're at a weak point in your life, you begin to doubt. That's just, that's a natural thing. So if you start doubting when you're in pain, don't get upset. It's normal. The problem is you come around church, folks, and they help you doubt. <laughs> Instead of lifting you up with affirmation, they help you doubt all the more. Amen? So it says be merciful to those who doubt. When... What is, the right, what is the Christ-like response to someone who doubts? You don't debate them. You don't demean them. You don't put them down. You don't help them pity party. You don't disown them and you don't desert them. You show mercy. You understand them. You support them. But you come along and you say to them, I know it seems like that right now, but brother, I'm here to tell you that God is where God's always been, right there with you. I'm here to tell you that the promises of God are true. I will not leave you nor forsake you. You're going to get through this. God's going to see you through this. And in those moments when you're at your least and at your worst moment, God is going to be there to lift you up. That's how you show mercy to people who are in doubt. You don't say, oh, I know, honey. I, I know what it's like. No, you don't go there. You go the opposite direction. That's what mercy does. Amen? Show mercy to those who are in doubt when they're in pain because that's the time they're probably going to doubt the most. Um, for me, watch, watching my mom in the last two years of her life were my doubtful times. Those were my doubtful times. We called her the tower of power too sweet to be sour. Because that's who she was to us. To see that crumble before our eyes was hard for me. And I, and I have to be honest, I sort of put her on a pedestal that she didn't want to be on. But it was a doubtful time to watch this woman who, in my mind, had done it right since she was 12 years old and accepted the Lord, to go through this and thank God that she was merciful. Now, sometimes she was cuttingly merciful to me. <laughs> she would say things when she knew. Mom, you know moms have this thing. They know about their children. You who mom know what I mean by this or have had a mom like this. And she knew when I wasn't at a good place. One time she said, I know you having a problem with this. She called me in Atlanta. And she said, uh, I just returned from home. And she said, I'm worried about you. Okay. I was. She said, you're not handling this very well. Talking about her battle with cancer and stuff. And she said, I, you know, I'm worried about it. And I thought, you're the one in the hospital. And you're worried about me. And so she said, and she said to me, she said, you need to know Mama knows the Lord. And I've known him since I was 12. And I'm just as confident of my salvation today as I was when I accepted him. 
And you need to be confident of it too. She knew I was, me and God was not on good terms. You know, how could you let this happen to my mama who served you all these years? But she was being merciful to me in my doubting time. And God used that to bring me to a place where you cannot scare me with death anymore. Death is no big deal, as Jake Hess used to say. It just ain't no big deal. Now, I ain't big on the process, okay? <laughs> I don't want to go through what mom wants to, but, you know, someone threatened to kill me? Okay, I'm going to be hit with the Lord. What, what, what's next on your list? Amen? I haven't said that. I'm not homesick yet, but... <laughs> But you see what I'm saying? And it's because someone was merciful. Mama was merciful to me in the moments of my doubt. And you're going to have seasons of doubt. There are going to be moments in your life when things happen to you that you are not prepared for. And doubt will set in. Don't begin to think there's something wrong with you. That's just life. Baby, welcome to life. But what I'm telling you, if there's somebody around you in the church who's going through that moment of doubt, your job is not to help them pity party. It is not to bemoan them and doubt their, and make them even doubt more of their faith. Your job is to be merciful to them, is to come alongside them and to encourage them and to lift them up and to bring affirmation in their life. Amen? Because you're merciful when you help someone going through that time of doubt. Number four, if I'm merciful, they just get worse and worse, don't they? And I bet some of you sitting back and where is the good news in this mess? This really is good news. I'm, I, I'm sorry. It, you just don't feel it. Luke 6, 33, 35 to 38. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that? Even sinners do that. Even Bobby do that. That's what he's saying there. All right, okay. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Then your reward will be great. Be merciful just as your father is. I didn't make this stuff up, okay? It's in the book. If you want to be like God, you got to be merciful. Do good to those who do evil to you. That's the exact opposite of what society tells, tells us. I, I, I remember that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King used to say, what is with all this uh, eye for an eye and two for two stuff? If, if we live by that rule, he says, we're going to have a lot of blind and toothless people in this world. Because he knew the gospel, the scripture says, be good to your enemies. That's why he practiced nonviolence. Amen? Society says when someone hurts you, you hurt them back. You get even. Gossip about them. Destroy them. Anything you can do, do it to them. God says, no, you, don't, you not only forgive that person, you be nice to that person. I shared with you about Oh, the situation I observed about her. I, that stood out in my mind because it's so hard for me to do it. And I watched her do it with such grace. And, and, and afterwards, uh, I, after that last time I mentioned that, she said to me, I just knew that was the right thing to do. Boy, she's ahead of me. Amen? Yeah, she's ahead of you too. <laughs> Remember, mercy is love and action. It's the way God treats people. God is kind, and God is merciful, and slow to anger. And the rest of that verse in the Living Bible says, God is compa God's compassion is entertained in everything that God does. Sometimes God meets, um, actually, sometimes you meet people who are just oddballs. They're just oddballs. They're sort of like heavenly sandpaper. They irritate the hell out of you. I'm sorry. The daylight's out of you. <laughs> I 
I need mercy, sister. <laughs> Give me a little mercy on that. <laughs> and there are some people you just don't get along with. Have you ever met someone like that? There are, some time, there are times I don't know why this person irritates me so bad. It's just something about it. But this is the thing I've learned. You need to be patient with that person. Because if you check out their background, you will usually realize in that hurting people hurt people. And so you have to learn to be forgiven to them because we're all odd to somebody. No matter how pretty you are or how handsome you are, <laughs> you're irritating to somebody. Amen? That person just lifted their glasses up. It's very irritating to me. <laughs> and, and so we all stumble. Nobody's perfect. Don't hold a grudge. Sometimes you have to deal with difficult situations. That's fine. But you need to do good to those who have done bad to you. That's mercy. And that's tough to do is for me. It's very tough to do and that's why you need some powerful motivators to become a merciful person. You need something to motivate you towards it because it's not natural, is it? What's natural for you when somebody it gets under your skin? Is it natural for you to say, oh bless your heart without that connotation? <laughs> is, it, is it natural to say, I love you when they do that to you? Uh -uh, come on, let's be honest. It is just not natural. So you, in order to be merciful, in order to do this, God knows this. In order for you to really do this, you need some motivators to get you to this point. Amen? It's easy for me to be nice to people who I love. It's easy to be nice to people I love. But... For those heavenly sandpaper people in your life, you need some motivation to be merciful. And, and, and so th there's, there's three of them I want to hit real quick. Yeah, quick. Number, number one, I need to be merciful because God... Shouldn't you be merciful to other people just as I have been merciful to you? That's what Matthew 18 and 3 says. God expects me to do to others... What God has already done for me. Um, think about those people who really tick you off. If you're really having a hard time being merciful to them, you remember what a jerk you've been to God. Ooh! <laughs> you remember what a jerk you've been to God. I think of all the flack that God's taken from J.R. And when I remember all that stuff that I've done my way and not God's way, and I think yet God still loves me, I think of all the dumb stunts in my life that I've pulled, and God has been merciful and kind and gotten me out of it. All the things I've done wrong, and God continues to shower me with God's love and God's mercy and God's grace. And then I stop and I remind myself, God, if you can be merciful to me when I pull this kind of stuff, maybe you're right. And maybe I need to try to be merciful to others. Maybe I need to try to be merciful to others. Um, one day some religious hypocrites, I mentioned it early in the, in the sermon, came to Jesus and they brought this woman who had been caught in the, they say it, the scripture, the very act of adultery. And they tossed in front of Jesus. And my first response is always, and where was the man? That woman couldn't commit adultery by herself. So where was the man? And not an interesting little point of view. Anyway, they talked to him, they threw it down, and they said, Jesus, this lady was caught in the very act of adultery. And you know what the law says. If you're caught doing adultery, you get stoned to death. And boy, you could see it dripping off their lips. 
And Jesus said, you're right. You're absolutely right. That's exactly what the law said. Let's stone her to death. But you who without sin cast the first stone. I love that story. Mama's take on it. Mama says, we, he, the scripture says he stooped down and began to write in the sand. And Mama used to say it like this. She said, uh, the scripture does not record it and history does not tell us what it was that he was writing. But Mama said, I, I, I assume that what he was writing was the big sins of all those people who brought. <laughs> and when they came up there, they went, ooh, he knows. <laughs> and took off. <laughs> That's Mama's take on the story. <laughs> because the Bible says they all went away. And when Jesus looked up and said, Woman, where's your accusers? And she said, They're gone. They're not here to accuse. And he said, Neither do I. They're not here to condemn. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and say no more. And that was it. You see, another time Jesus was said, you church folk, I just don't get you. He says, y'all seem to be so concerned about the problem in everybody else's life. You're so concerned about that speck of sawdust in another church member's life. And you got that telephone pole hanging out that socket where your eye goes. And he said, why don't you get that telephone pole out your eye and maybe the sawdust in their eye won't look that big. That was the J.R. paraphrase. Okay, what Jesus said. In other words, he said, you hypocrite, there's no contest here. You're so concerned about something they're doing wrong when you are doing a lot worse. Don't you know that, don't you, haven't you seen church people, I just can't believe church folk act that way. And, they, and the things they're doing are worse. They want to beat you up over some little insignificant thing, and they are doing much worse. I'll give you an example. Church folk, because I grew up with this, they jump all over somebody for having a drink. And yet, they got diabetes and everything else from gluttony. I shouldn't talk like that, should I? <laughs> but you, you get what I mean? They're killing themselves. Somebody had one drink, and they're killing themselves every time they sit down and stuff themselves at the table. And so Jesus said, take a look. Amen? So to be merciful, I need to show mercy. We tend to judge other people by their worst faults. And we tend to judge ourselves by our best intentions. That's a good line. I'd remember that one if I was you. That's true. We tend to judge other people by their worst faults, but we tend to judge us by our intentions. You know how that plays out? Well, when I do something wrong, well, I've said it a million times. You know how it works. When I do something wrong, Patricia, why come you can't understand? It was just a mistake. Okay? Get over it. But you do something wrong. Sister, there's no excuse for what you just did. That's how we do it. That's how that plays out. We judge ourselves. We judge other people by their worst faults and judge us by our, worst, our best intentions. You need to use the same standard because the Bible, this is about mercy. You get what you give. What you put out is what's going to come back. Amen? Be merciful. Why? Because God has shown mercy to me. Number two. Anybody plan on being perfect in the future? And let me see how many liars in the group. Okay, no liars. Okay. <laughs> Not only has God been merciful to me in the past, I'm going to need it again. I'm, that's life, Okay. I don't expect to be perfect from this day until Jesus comes. Maybe the day before, but not until he comes. <laughs> so I'm going to need some more mercy is what this is. James, the second chapter, 13 verse, the person who makes no allowances for others 
will find none made for him or her. Again, I'd be very careful about what you throw around. Only those who give it, get it. Those who give mercy, get mercy. Those who don't give mercy, don't get no mercy back. And I said it just the way I intended to. You say, but you don't know how much that person hurt me. And they continue to hurt me. I can't forgive them. Then I hope you never sin. Because forgiveness and mercy is a two-way street. When you refuse to forgive others, refuse to show mercy to others, remember you get what you get. Let me tell you something. We say it every Sunday, and I bet you most of you gloss over and don't really think about it. When we do that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, that prayer says, forgive us as we forgive those who transgress against us. That's what we say. We say you get what you give, you give, or you get what you give. Every Sunday, we just say it a different way. And, and this was the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And so what Jesus was putting and institutionalized in how we ought to pray is this whole thing of mercy. That if you want it back, you got to give it. And you'll only, he, he put in this law of direct return, you only get what you give. If you want forgiveness, then you better give it. Amen? The Bible said those who show mercy receive it. I need to be merciful because I'm going to need it again. I, I'm going to make mistakes. Be very, be very careful when you are demanding justice on somebody else because you just might get some justice on yourself. And honey, let's just be, let's just, let's just realize if we got what we deserved, none of us would be here. I am so thankful that God allows a lot of crop failure in my life. Because the seeds I've sown sometimes have not been mercy. Mercy is given to others not what they deserve, but what they need. And you give it because you're going to need it again too. The last one. I give it because I know some of you are saying, you have got to be kidding with that one. You got to be a lunatic to say that. Mercy makes me happy. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Happy are the merciful. Remember, you get what you give. The opposite is true, too. Unmerciful, unhappy are the unmerciful. Let me see if I can just make it just as plain as I can. The most miserable people I have ever encountered, the most miserable people I know, are people who are resentful, who absolutely refuse to give up a grudge. Now, some of y'all know about this instance. I had a friend who was a member of this church I had been friends with 16 years. Even when we lived in a different city, we, had been, we lived right across the parking lot from each other. When he moved off to another state, I actually helped pack him up and go and help unpack him. I mean, we had been so close. And he got angry at me because I wouldn't take sides in a relationship breakup. Because as the pastor of this church, nobody gets the church in the divorce. Amen? Both people still get the church. And this is, this is a shared custody. Okay? Nobody gets the church in a divorce. Both of you get it. But he is laying near death's door right now for no other reason than he has allowed absolute bitterness to just rape his life right away from him. So when Jesus said, happy are the merciful, unhappy are the unmerciful. 
because they these people who refuse to give up a grudge holding on to that unforgiveness over somebody else's head they don't realize they're hurting themselves unmercy being unmerciful makes you miserable it makes you lose out on being among the saints and all that kind of stuff Proverbs 11 17 your own soul is nourished when you're kind it is destroyed when you're cruel. Doing acts, you know why? Because doing acts of mercy has this way of just getting us outside of ourselves. If you're feeling really bad, get the focus off of you and put it on others, and that has a way of producing happiness. Don't ask me how it works. Jesus can explain that to you. I can't. But one of the, I do know that one of the ways, one of the most tremendous ways to get rid of depression is to just practice acts of mercy. And as you somehow learn to just give it away, that's how you begin to have happiness come in your life. You ought to be merciful simply because it makes you happy. It's a boomerang blessing, amen? You throw it out there, it comes back. The other one comes back too, amen? How then do I become a merciful person? You first experience God's mercy. You can't offer something you don't have. You can't give what you don't have. So you have to, you cannot offer mercy, you cannot offer forgiveness until someone else has offered it to you. And I'm telling you that the Lord Jesus Christ has offered you mercy and forgiveness and all you have to do is say Lord I receive it and once you receive it then you begin to practice giving it to others the reason some of us don't do it because we don't think that person deserve it did you deserve it when you got it no but God wants to forgive you simply because God is forgiving loving and mercy it's God's nature and when you've received it then you have to do something. In order to be a merciful person, you got to give mercy to other people. And the way you do that is you have to do it through the eyes of Jesus Christ and not just through your eyes of seeing what they have done. Remember how God sees you through Jesus Christ? God sees you perfect. Why? Are you perfect? No. But how is it that God sees you perfect when everybody else sees you ain't? Because God looks at you covered by the blood. And the blood of Jesus Christ makes you perfect. So when you look through the eyes of Jesus, you begin to see not people's sin, but their aspiration and their hopes and what they can be, their best thing. Let me ask you something. What are the hurts that you see in somebody's life that you haven't been able to give mercy to? What are the needs that you see in that person's life that you haven't been able to extend mercy to? If you can't see it, if it's at all possible, then make it your business to find out their story. Look at them through the eyes of Jesus. You know, and here's a hint, mercy sometimes is just walking away. Remember last week part of the gospel we didn't read was after all the stuff that Jesus had did and people got so excited when he didn't do all these miracles and stuff in his hometown they took him out to the edge of the cliff and wanted to throw him off and at the end of that passage of scripture it says that but, but Jesus passed through him and went on his way. That was being merciful. But he could have did them in. You know that, don't you? Sometimes being merciful, if you want to have some peace in your life, you walk away from the situation. You don't go back and replay it. Walk away. That's the merciful thing sometimes. That's how you show God's mercy sometimes. You simply leave it to God and walk away. Let me ask you tonight, who in your life, 
people and your friends, your co-workers, who here in covenant need your mercy? Who is it in your life that you're still holding the past over their head? And every time they do something you don't like, you bring it back up for ammunition. It's always silently in the background. Let me tell you something. If you're in a relationship, that's a great way to kill a relationship. Who is it you need to say a word of forgiveness to this week? You need to let them off the hook. You need to wipe the slate clean. Who is it? Who is it you need to never mention it to them again? It's over and done with and forgiven. For your sake. For your sake. Not theirs. For your sake. Be happy. Be happy. Show some mercy. Because you, be, you get what you give. I believe that that's what God wants us to do here at Covenant. Show mercy. Because God knows that's the only way you're going to have peace in your life. That's the only way you're going to have peace in your life is you learn to give mercy to other people. And if you do, you'll have wonderful peace. Nothing will bring peace in your heart like showing mercy. Let's stand and sing. between me and thee while we're absent, one from the other. Amen.